When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey and a colt with her excuse me, a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. Very large crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him um, and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet, Jesus, from Nazareth in Galilee. Say is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, in the fifth inning of Game 3 of the 1932 World Series, played on October the 1st, 1932, when Babe Ruth stepped into the batter's box that day. Babe Ruth was a living legend. He was certainly then, and may still be, the greatest hitter to ever pick up a bat and whack it at a baseball. Hitting a baseball in the major leagues is one of the hardest things to do in sport. The best people at it do it less than 40% of the time. If I did my job well only 40% of the time, I would get fired, friends. If you hit a baseball 40% of the time, you are one of the greatest players ever. And probably the best power hitter in the game the best long ball man that maybe ever lived, was and is Babe Ruth. From 1918 to 1931, a 13-year span, he led the majors in homers 11 out of those 13 years. The home run record that he posted uh, at the end of his career in 1934 stood until the 1970s when hammering Hank Aaron stepped up to the plate. Babe Ruth was and is a phenomenal home run hitter and a terror to any pitcher at any time. And so, when he stepped into the batter's box in the fifth inning, the score tied four to four. It's the top of the fifth. The go-ahead run was on base already. Babe Ruth had an opportunity to fundamentally change that game. And anyone who's ever been a hitter knows that you try a little harder when you know it could make the difference uh, for your teammates. On top of that, the Cubs and their fans uh, had been going out of the way to try and throw Babe Ruth off his game. They had been hurling verbal abuse at him from the dugout and from the stands for the entire series. On top of that, they had been throwing vegetables and fruit at Babe Ruth and apparently had spit on Babe Ruth's wife. So Babe Ruth, not a happy camper with the Cubs. So they were trying to unnerve him. Again, hitting somewhat about the architecture of your shoulders and the, the way you hold your arms, but a lot of it is psychological. Do you have the patience? Do you have the concentration? They were doing what they could to throw that off. And so Babe Ruth stood up at the plate and he let one strike go by. And the abuse from the Cubs dugout increased even more. Pitcher wound up through 
Babe Ruth won another strike. Sail on by him. It's now an 0-2 count. The abuse from the Cubs is now apoplectic. What happens next, I'll admit, is up for some debate in sports circles. Definitely, Babe Ruth made some sort of meaningful gesture with his bat. Some say he was merely gesturing at the Cubs dugout saying, hey y'all, don't count me out yet. I've got one more strike to deal with. The more fun version of this story, and certainly the version that has gone down in history, is that Babe Ruth took that bat that he was so good at using and pointed it out to straight center field as if to say, that's where I'm going to hit the ball. He called his shot. What happened after that is not up for debate. Babe Ruth got back up into his batter stance. The pitcher threw another, threw another strike. Babe Ruth connected with that ball, and that ball flew, flew over 440 feet out over the flagpole at dead center in Wrigley Field. It was one of the longest long balls in Wrigley Field history, and it happened to go exactly the trajectory of where Babe Ruth pointed his bat that day. Two runs scored. It was now six to four. And as Babe Ruth rounded the bases, I'll tell you, uh, journalists reported that the Cubs dugout was a lot quieter than it used to be. He shut him down. The Yankees went on to win that game 7-5, to five, uh, went on to clench the series in the next game uh, with a 13-6 to six blowout against the Cubs. Babe Ruth called his shot. Babe Ruth, as this living legend among living legends, it was a credible threat that he made. And then he absolutely made good on his called shot with a tremendous homer that we still remember now nearly 90 years after it happened. But George Herman Babe Ruth Jr. was not the first person to be a credible threat and call their shot and make good on it. Essentially, in essence, that's what Jesus is doing in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Yes, minus a giant ball of machismo, which I think is the most accurate description I can give for Babe Ruth. If anyone could be described as a giant ball of machismo, it's Babe Ruth. And so mi minus the machismo, um, and with the addition of an extreme amount of godly humility, in entering Jerusalem, Jesus is calling his shot before he's done the things that truly seal the deal that, yo, this guy is definitely the Messiah. His death, his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection. Before all of that, he is calling his shot and saying, I am the Messiah, and this is going to look different than you think it is. It is a grand act before the actions that we call Holy Week, before the actions of his death and resurrection, to call the shot and say, no, this isn't what makes me the Messiah. This merely reveals me as the Messiah. I am the Messiah now and always. Because if you look at how, certainly how Matthew 21, 1 through 11 is written, it is written structurally to point out just the sheer volume of prophecy that Jesus is making sure that he checks off and all of those prophecies relate back to Jesus being the Messiah. Right? So when he gets on the donkey and he starts from the Mount of Olives, well, starting from the Mount of Olives is traditionally where you expected the Messiah to come from because that's what's talked about it in Zechariah 14, 1 through 11. So that was a prophecy. 
than the fact that he is going into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and that Jerusalem is receiving him. That's a prophecy. That's in Isaiah 62. That he's on the donkey and the colt of the donkey. That's a prophecy. That's Zechariah 9, 9. Then that the crowd shout Hosanna and welcome the son of David. Well, we know from prophecy after prophecy after prophecy woven throughout the whole deal that the Messiah is a son of David, is from the house of David. And so, of course, that connects the Messiah. They're quoting Psalm 118 and even the words Hosanna means something like save, I pray, or help, I pray, or save us, I pray, some version of that. It has to do with this person, the Messiah, bringing about a kind of salvation. This puts an exclamation point with each prophecy. Mount of Olives, entering Jerusalem, donkey, crowd celebrating, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. Look at all the prophecies that I fulfill. So here, the kind of core prophecy as far as Matthew is concerned, it once again from Matthew 21, 4 through 5. And this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming, humble, and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. Okay, so there isn't actually one Bible verse that says this. This is the mashup of two pieces of scripture. The first half is from Isaiah 62, uh, where it talks about, look, Zion, look who's coming. Um, and then the bit about coming on a donkey, that is the Zechariah 9.9. 9. But... These are two pieces of prophecy, both related to the Messiah. But they also bring out a difference. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. And yet, Jesus fulfills the prophecies. Yo, let me tell you. But, it doesn't look the way people expected the Messiah to look. During this time in first century Judea, there was a real real desire for a Messiah. There was a real desire for salvation. But that meant salvation from the Romans. That meant a political salvation from the outside occupier and the reestablishing of a literal throne of David as the literal political ruler of the people. And so, yeah, they expected a Messiah to come in triumph from the Mount of Olives. But they expected this Messiah to be on a war horse and wearing armor, not on a donkey in the homespun robes of a carpenter. And they expected this person to be trailed not by a ragtag bunch of misfits and just a crowd of ordinary people, but to be followed by generals and riches and chariots and captured slaves. You know, the things that belong in a proper triumphal entry to drive out the Romans. Because you see, this whole idea of a victory march was a big deal in ancient, ancient times. Conquering heroes entered conquered cities with these triumphal processions. That's how the Caesars did it. That's how all the great rulers did it. Even it's like how Napoleon did it. That's how we have an Arc de Triomphe, right? They do these grand processions showing off their force and showing off what they've conquered. This Galilean carpenter in homespun robes with a ragtag group of fisher people and ordinary folks just throwing their clothes on the ground. What on earth is this dude going to do against the Romans? He did not look the way he was supposed to. He looked like an ordinary, humble guy, not a massive military ruler. But there's no denying they got the message. The people and the hierarchy 
got the message. They saw, they knew these prophecies. They saw them being fulfilled. Message received. That's what's happening uh, in Matthew 21, 10, and 11, talking about the turmoil that this throws Jerusalem into. Hear them again. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So that word turmoil there is a kind of a bad translation. It's not a big deal enough. Turmoil can be big or, it can be big or small. What happens here is the same word that gets translated as the effect of an earthquake. Right? In Greek, it is this like earth shaking problem. This earth shattering feeling is what hits Jerusalem when they see this homestun carpenter from Galilee riding on a donkey down from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem with the people singing Hosanna to the son of David. And the Pharisees notice. And the temple hierarchy notices. And the Romans notice. And they begin to think in their minds, oh, some real may be happening here. Something we need to look into. Something we need to be worried about is happening here. This man is calling quite a shot, and he seems to know exactly what he's doing. And at least at this moment, the crowd get it too. They've caught this glimpse of something immaculate, something amazing, something incredible, and they're just glomming to it and spontaneously singing Hosanna as they come in. They've caught a glimpse, this moment of the kingdom, and they get it. They call him the son of David. They call him a prophet. They see that this man is different. This man is something. He may only look like a simple Galilean carpenter, but he is way more than that. The son of David, the Messiah, has arrived. It just looks really different. But we feel it, and we're reacting to it. The crowd responds, and as we see, as we'll see throughout this week, certainly the leadership responds. The leadership is unnerved, freaked out by the power that Jesus wields and the power that the shot that Jesus is calling means. But there's no denying two things. One, Jesus is the Messiah. But two, that Messiah is different. That Messiah is humble, not showy. That Messiah is loving, not all-conquering. Because this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, mighty God, Lord of everything. Jesus is the one who was there with God in the beginning, and the world came into being through him. That, that, the babe born in the manger immaculately, the person that's going on to the cross. Yeah, 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 this is Jesus. He is Lord of all, but this Lord of all rides on a humble donkey. This mighty God serves people rather than expecting to be served. The Lord of all creation is going to kneel down and wash his disciples' feet. The son of David, the savior of us all, will do so via self-sacrifice, not through merely calling others to sacrifice instead of him. This is fundamentally who Jesus is. And this kingdom then that we catch this glimpse of here is itself different because of the Messiah, the Savior who creates it. This then is a kingdom that doesn't value conquest and pomposity. It values humility and love. It doesn't value the things of this world, riches, wealth, and popularity, earthly power. It's all about who are you in God, not who are you in the newspaper, or who are you on Instagram, or who are you on CNN, Fox News, NBC, etc. It's not about who can you get to bow down to you? It's about emptying of yourself, giving of yourself, 
as Christ Jesus did. Friends, it's not just on Palm Sunday that we have the opportunity to join this parade. Because yes, Jesus is calling his shot as to what's going to happen over the next week of his life. That he is going to show up and it really is going to look like he turns out, he's, spoiler alert, he's the Messiah. And we catch a glimpse of what that looks like. But in this, we also catch a glimpse of what the end of time looks like. What it looks like when God's will is done truly here on the earth as it is in heaven. And it is a joyful procession of God's people praising the Lord and following a humble, loving, self-sacrificing Savior. And so, friends, I call on us all to join that mighty celestial parade. Do the things in this life that make that parade more visible to all because it is already here. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, God, Jesus brought into the world this parade, this party, this kingdom of God that we get to be a part of every time we choose love over hate, every time we choose another over ourselves, every time we choose humility over grandeur. We too join that throng of people singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday is not just an image of a victory 2,000 years ago or the calling of the shot of a victory 2,000 years ago. It is also a calling of the shot of the victory at the end of time that we know to be certain because Christ died and rose again, because he redeemed us, we redeemed us once, we also know that our world will be fully redeemed and we can participate at that heavenly banquet at the end of time. May we join in to the Messiah that is humble, loving, and self-sacrificing. May we do that as well so this parade may grow larger and longer and even more joyous. Let us pray. Gracious loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you've given us this vision of what your victory looks like. What your victory at the end of Holy Week looks like. What your victory at the end of time looks like. Loving God, stir up in our hearts a desire to join that parade. Join that parade of the humble Savior. Join that parade of the loving God. Join that parade of the self-sacrificing Messiah. May we, through the power of your spirit moving in us, emulate that and put our hope and faith in that. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.